Hey everyone, welcome to the Open Source Founder Podcast. Joining me today is James Perkins, co-founder and CEO of Ankit.dev. James, thanks so much for joining. I'm very excited for this and would love to start with some information about your personal background all the way to how Anki got started. You met Andreas. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, so my name is James Perkins. Uh, I've been in the industry for the last 15 or so years. Uh, I started my career at a startup that was basically uh, funded by banks. So it wasn't VC funded. It was funded directly from a bank. Um, and then I've moved around my career. I've been in Fortune 500 companies all the way back down to startups again. Uh, my most recent startups. Before Anki, I worked at Plaid, which is a fintech company. I worked at Tina CMS, which is an open source uh, CMS that basically uses MDX plus Git and gives you like visual editing. And then my most recent one before I left to go to Anki was Clerk, which is an authentication provider, uh, which is quite popular now for React developers. Um, and then, yeah, then Anki came about. Um, and we can talk about how that came about because the story is uh, kind of interesting. Um, I met Andreas probably a year before Anki was really started. Uh, we had interacted through a couple of different channels. First, I helped Andreas when he was working on Planetfall, uh, which was very, very early on in the app router world. It was like Next.js 13 had just come out. Um, and and typical Andreas, bleeding edge, right on the very edge of bleeding, um, was was working on that. Um, and Clerk had released a package that did support app router, just had some rough edges because we were kind of working on a very short timeline. Um, and so I helped Andreas get through that. And then we stayed in touch throughout that period of time. I did some work for Upstash, um, some consulting work and, and some advice and some stuff around DevRel and marketing and all those fun things that are really hard to get started when you're in a pre-seed or seed. Um, and then Andreas pitched me one day, hey, I have this idea for co-marketing, which was essentially how Anki started. He wanted to basically take Clerk and Upstash and kind of make sort of what Anki is today, which was basically like, how could we do this in a way that used Upstash and, and Clerk together and make some sort of API key management system, make it really easy for people to, to basically handle some of this stuff. Um, and then he pitched it to me and I said, no, 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 let's, let's do this instead. Like we talked about it for a little bit internally over Discord and then I was like, we should just do this. Um, we hadn't really worked on a project together uh, before that. Um, and then we just took the idea and said, let's do it and see what happens. Uh, so it took us about seven or so days from idea to like an MVP-ish. And that was like a lot of copying and pasting code from other projects that we'd done over the years. And it just kind of slapped it all together, used templates from like Tailwind and all sorts of things like that, just to get the idea out there. Um, and then we launched it and apparently people wanted it. Um, it got very, it did very well. Like the first week we, we did like 750 stars. Uh, we had almost a thousand signups. Um, and then within July, we were like, okay, well, this seems viable. We should add some sort of pricing so mm -hmm. that we can potentially monetize this or at least find out if people are even interested in paying for a service that does this idea. Being 100% open source and already, we were kind of like, maybe people don't want to pay for this and maybe they'll want to use it for free, but maybe there's no monetization there. Um, and we monetized it. And, and a few days later, we had our first paying customer and they weren't a small customer. So it wasn't just like a random developer. It was a fairly mm -hmm. large customer at the time who was uh, building out an API and it just happened to all kind of align. Um, and we had all the features they needed uh, at the time. And so we, we would, we talked to them and we were very excited. And then we were like, well, if this customer's coming on, we're probably going to have to incorporate because neither one of us want the tax burden of the payments that come from this. Uh, so we incorporated and as we were incorporating, we got introduced to a bunch of VCs. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that's kind of how the, Hey, we, maybe we could get this funded discussion started. Um, and before that, we, we, there, there is a famous Discord message between Andreas and I that says, like, we are both very happy with our jobs. 
Let's keep doing this part time. Let's not try and get funded. Let's just do this as a side project. And occasionally, <laughs> yeah, occasionally it ends up in in our Slack messages as like, remember this um, as a as a joke. Um, but yeah, we which then started the VC thing, which I, I can happily talk about um, and and how fundraising kind of works and and kind of how that uh, progresses. And especially in open source, it's a bit of an interesting conversation. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how Unki gets started. And now we are here, uh, you know, almost six months later. I love it. Uh, it's phenomenal. Thanks so much for sharing the story so far. And it sounds like an overnight success. Shipped an MVP in a week and then got paying customers even before being incorporated. Of course, there's this long career, uh, both of you guys uh, behind, to lead to this. And for people that don't know, Andreas, he's Cronarch on Twitter. That's maybe mm -hmm. how I love see him. And have you guys met in person so far? Nope. <laughs> nope, we've only ever we've only ever talked uh, through a camera. Uh, we we are going to do an Unki uh, meetup in sort of March April time, where we'll get the whole team together. We can actually like see each other without seeing each other. Basically, what you see today, which is just like from the waist up, is pretty much all we ever <laughs> see of each other. That's great. And and yeah, speaking about the team, uh, how have you expanded uh, the group uh, up to this day? Yeah, so we after we got funding, um, I was the first person to actually go full time, and that was pre-funding. So it was about uh, we we'd done the funding deal. We knew the money was there. We just didn't actually have the money. Um, so I I started in September. Um, Andreas started November first. I think it was November first because he being he's so for people he's in Germany. Uh, which mm -hmm. means there are German laws around how you can leave a job. So depending on how long you've been at that job, you have to give a notice based upon that. So it can be anywhere from 30 days all the way up to some ridiculous amount that's very, very long in the future. Um, so we had to kind of play across that. Um, and when we did that, uh, we got the funding and I said to Andreas, like, hey, I know a junior dev that doesn't have a lot of experience, uh, but I think you know, I've known him for, for almost 15 years myself. I think he could actually do the job and do it really well. And I would bet my shares of the company on it. Wow. Um, <laughs> okay. And Andreas was like, okay, let's meet and let's talk. And then gut feeling, gut check, let's go from there. Wow. And uh, so he, he met with him, was like, yeah, I think it will be okay. So we, we ended up hiring Mike, who's been our junior dev, and he's been crushing it since he started in late October. Uh, and then January 1st, technically January 2nd, we just, uh, our second team member started another developer named Dom who came from Vassell, um, has like an engineering slash sales engineering background. Um, and so, yeah, it's super exciting to, 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 to kind of make the team grow and it's, you know, an experience to go and hire people and think about like how, what part of the team do they bring versus like being part of small departments. Cause I've been a manager for in multiple places and you only have to really worry about your department and that's the only thing you have to worry about but when you start a company you have to worry about like how do they fit into the company and what do they bring and exactly. you know even if they have these weaknesses how do the strengths of whatever they have kind of kind of play out um so that was an interesting experience for both uh, andreas and i and then we have to learn about you know how do you pay these people and like all those things that you don't really think about when you're just an employee you're just like cool i hired this person and they get paid then you have to worry about like how do they get paid and how do you stay compliant with each country that you pay people in all those kinds of things. I love it. This sounds excellent. Our team um, assembled and so everyone's excited for what's to come. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if you could share uh, right now, is there something that people can expect when it comes to the next big release or something you're cooking? Yeah, we're, we're cooking quite a lot. Uh, but the, the next thing that is really on the horizon uh, for us is moving into authorization. So right now, Unkey is only really truly authentication. So you get in a key, you verify it. If it says it's true, that's it. There's no uh, way to say like add a role or add specifics to say like this API key can only be a read and this one is write and delete. Like you can't do any of that right now. Um, and that's what we're working on right now. So we're going to have role-based authentication. Um, so our back pretty soon. Um, and then we just released today our CLI auth, 
examples. So now you can see how to do CLI auth from end to end. Uh, so you don't have to manipulate JWTs or anything. You can just use Unkey to essentially give someone authentication through CLI. Exactly. And and for that, I think you used Clack. You made a YouTube video about it too. Um, yeah, so we didn't, I don't think we used Clack uh, for this that. example. Uh, this is another CLI that I have cooking in the background on how you can contribute to Unkey without having to like spend so much time like bootstrapping it. Essentially, it would mm -hmm. be like two commands and it will download that the GitHub repository, put everything in the right places, and then you don't have to worry. Uh, but I use Clack for that, which uh, is is really, really nice. If you know TypeScript, JavaScript, it makes CLIs really easy. So speaking of the YouTube video, actually, I think, uh, well, personally, I would love to hear about your YouTube career so far. And then, of course, how it has also helped today with you know distribution uh, and marketing for uh, Anki. Uh, followed by, you know, hopefully advice to other content creators who or people who want to get started. Uh, super curious to, to hear your advice here. Yeah, so the YouTube career, uh, I started during COVID. Uh, it was just one of those things where I was like, well, I have all this free time now. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not doing anything. Uh, what could I do to, to, to maybe educate some people? I've been in the industry for, for, you know, like 12 years or so, and I've done a variety of jobs. So I thought, well, if I know this stuff, like maybe I can educate somebody on, on pieces of content or how to learn or how to become a developer. All these kinds of things kind of popped into my head. So I started with uh, what I knew at the time, which was for a long time in career, I was Java developer mm -hmm. at enterprise level. Um, so I did a lot of like pre like intros into Java and like how that works and, and, and how you can manipulate data with Java. Um, and and on top of that, I was doing things like Java questions that you'd get in an interview. So those kinds of things that like are super helpful when you're trying to get a job. Um, and over time, I realized that that was really boring uh, for me. Not for the for the content people that are consuming it was great, right? But for me, it was so boring. There's no challenge to it. It was not very exciting. Um, which then led me to to kind of move from that into. What I was doing daily, which is like React development, mm -hmm. but building it at a level of crash course level. So every so my initial YouTube career started as Java, and then I moved into web dev, and it started as crash courses. So these videos were anywhere from forty to like three hours long, um, and that really kind of helped me one understand how people learn, and two how to market myself as a person, uh, which I think now plays really, really well into Anki, which is like, how do you market a product that nobody's heard of? Uh, in a similar vein, when you start YouTube or you start a blog or you start TikTok or whatever your social media platform of choice may be today, um, nobody knows who you are and there has to be some sort of excitement to actually care. Um, and that goes through either producing really high quality content and then being also really enjoyable to watch. Uh, and usually what happens, at least in our space, it's kind of changing recently. Like if you look at who's popular in space, so if you look at like Theo or Primogen or any of those kinds of people, they found the way to educate you while also being incredibly entertaining enough for you to want to stick around and watch the next video. Um, and, and some of the older YouTubers that have been doing it for years, like Brad Travesy, who does crash courses and has done those for, I don't know how many years now. I remember watching videos and giving them to my new employees or juniors and be like, here's how you learn this. Just you watch Brad. It's like three hours long. Enjoy. Um, <laughs> it's still doing that same content and it still does really, really well. Um, so I think it's a fine balance of being entertaining and educating and just making sure that the content that you put out is high quality. Um, and if I was to start today, my mm -hmm. advice would be, for any new person is one, pick something that you actually enjoy. Don't think about how do I make this into a, you know, a side gig where I get paid loads of money. Like just throw that out of the window and think about if I did this for 10 years, could I do it every week? And if I can't do this, this for 10 years, and yeah, sure, it will evolve. But if I can't do the content I make on day one in 10 years, then you probably are picking the wrong topic. You're probably thinking this is going to, be really popular so i'm going to make loads of money off of it and then you're just going to get burnt out and bored um pick what in, you enjoy um and then just start it doesn't have to be the highest quality you don't need a 400 hundred dollar microphone and a 500 hundred dollar mixer and a 
thousand dollar camera start with your macbook uh if you've got a macbook just start with that camera and 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 any microphone will do even the macbook microphone is pretty good today and you can buy lav mics for twenty dollars um and then if you're making blogs just put it out there just start putting the content out there right daily or weekly or every whatever cadence works for you um and then that kind of shifts into to really how do you market a company is the same idea mm -hmm. um i wrote this really long blog post that broke our own blog um which was about how we market our unki um and this was kind of a transitional thing so when i wrote this blog post originally some of it was from how do we do devrel at clerk Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote this really long piece about how DevRel was basically dead today and, and the way that people were doing it were wrong and, and the old traditional ways of DevRel doesn't work, which if you haven't been around long enough, maybe you've never spent a, a lot of time with DevRel. The old way of DevRel was like code tutorials of how to get started with a product. And that was basically it, but it was just different layers of the same thing. Really simple, really shrunk down to basically nothing. So the value that a user gets out of it is only at the scale of, if I've never seen your product before, this is how I'm gonna get value from it. Or I've never interacted with this product before, this is how I get value. And when I went to Clerk, I was basically DevRel. And my attitude was, nobody cares about getting started. They can just go to the docs, read the quick start guide. It's the same value. So let's just do content that makes sense. So the first thing that we did was we did a lot of large form tutorials that actually solved an issue today. Whether that was like, how do I introduce RLS plus Clark to make like authenticated with Superbase? Like things like that, that really make sense. And people actually need that to solve a problem, whether they're building an app, a side project or a SaaS, like you need that piece to connect everything together. Um, and so we started there and then that kind of grew into, well, I can only do so much. I'm one, I'm one guy. I can only put out X pieces of content a week, a month, a year, and I can only talk to 200 podcasts and then people are going to get bored of me, right? If they hear my voice all the time, you're not going to listen. So I went with this strategy of finding people who I believed once they tried the product they would be a super fan, essentially. Mm -hmm. They would love the product so much that I wouldn't even have to approach them to say, hey, if I want this piece of content and you're a popular blogger, YouTuber, TikTok, Twitch, whatever, if I approach you and said, could I sponsor you? The odds of you are answering with a yes is very likely. And then I know whatever you put out is going to be genuine enough to make sense. Um, so I scoured the internet looking for people, uh, friends of mine, people that like I'd interacted with over the, like, the last few years. And I came up with this list and I put it in an ocean dock and said, okay, these are the people I want to try Clerk one time. Mm -hmm. And once they try it one time, if they hate it, that's fine. Just remove them from the list. If they love it and it suddenly solves some sort of issue for them, then we can talk about how can we sponsor this person. Um, and so for Clerk, it was Theo. So if people know Theo, Theo is very popular in the space now. Um, and, and even back then, I think he only had, so now he has 200K subs. I think back then it was at 50K or something like that. It was a lot less than he has today, but he had an audience that loved what he was doing. Um, and I badgered Theo for months and months about just random things like we we were interacting with each other we were you know doing all that kind of stuff and then i had realized talking through him he has create t3 app which is a popular open source project and they had a create t3 turbo app which is also a popular open source project which is essentially t3 on both expo and next.js and the problem they had was they could always authenticate the Next.js app, but there was no way for them to produce some sort of good authentication for the Expo app and have them interact so you could use one TRPC. So I said, okay, I can build that for you with Clerk and it will just work. So I built this repo out. It's still there at Clerk. I, I'm sure they're still maintaining it, but there's, there's, a, there's a project there. And I said, okay, here's the solution for you. Let's make a video. And so he tried Clerk a couple of times. And he was like, okay, yeah, yeah, let's do the sponsorship. So we did the sponsorship. 
And uh, the first video ever he did, he didn't even show any code. All he, it was a three minute video, and we intentionally show, showed no code at all. We just showed the app working from end to end and showed how it worked. And then like put a link to the GitHub and mm-hmm. said, like, this is how you can do it. And then the week afterwards, I did a video on my own channel that described like how the actual pieces fit together. So now we've made two pieces of content and I've paid Theo once. And then Theo was like, oh, cool, awesome, a video. Let me tweet about it. Let me post it on my own YouTube as a community post. And then that evolved into, okay, well, I'll make a blog post now so that can be found on the internet. And so now we have like three or four or five different pieces of media. And then that's how the relationship built. And then we went further and further. And Theo and I are now friends. Uh, Theo actually invested in, in Unki. Um, and like, that's kind of how you have to start your trend with a new startup. And it takes time. Uh, in the open source world, it's a bit easier, probably, because people that contribute, you can probably figure out, like, how can I make this person who contributes? Maybe they write a blog post or something like that. You can kind of angle it. Um, but it's all about finding those people. And once you find those people, um, you, you can go from there. And then things like Twitter and stuff, like if you have a business account for your Twitter account, just don't use it, uh, is essentially my opinion. And people get pretty upset about that. But uh, you're better off making your own personal account and using that personal account to promote your business. Um, if you look at Unki, like we, I don't think we, I think we post like, retweets and quote tweets and that's about it uh we've never really posted anything on there because people trust someone with a face but they don't trust the business i'm not going to follow a business like i'm not going to go and be like amazon aws let me follow the aws account i'm going to be like who's the devrel at aws okay it's this person let me follow them because they're going to have nuggets of information that i care about um aws is probably going to try and promote some new thing that i don't want right i'm just not interested in it. Um, and then as you build your brand up, you can then start using your own Twitter account or your X account, or whatever we want to call it today, uh, to do things like change logs or um, things like that. But you got to keep it f- fun for someone to interact with. So if you look at my Twitter and you look at Andreas's Twitter and you look at our, our Unki's Twitter, it's very much a lot of shit posts um, <laughs> because one, it's social media and it should be fun for everybody. And two, um, people like that stuff. They don't want to come to Twitter and be educated. They want to have fun. And maybe there's some education going on, but it's like very lighthearted. And um, doing those kinds of things, like lets people know that you're a real human and you're not just like some guy, some millionaire with a Ferrari. Like I'm not any of that. I have a car that's like 20 years old and I live in a house that's pretty small. Like I'm not some millionaire. I'm just some regular guy who just happened to build a company. and. Um, I think that gets lost as as people try and build their business up. Well, okay. Uh, that was phenomenal. Thanks so much for taking the time to say all this. Sure. In fact, the story with Theo was excellent, uh, back in what you said earlier. And, uh, you know, I, I, can, I can second the fact of how anyone can just get started, even if you don't have the gear and the mm-hmm. setup and everything. I mean, when starting this podcast last year, I did the first 25 interviews just recording a Zoom call. Mm-hmm. I didn't even with the max, you know, microphone and camera. I know it didn't look great, but I went through those reps. And so it was, it was super useful. And now I'm trying to step it up a little bit with this new season. Thanks again for, for joining. And um, that, was, that was excellent. That was a lot of great advice. Uh, that part specifically about um, on Twitter, for example, and on all channels, utilizing your personal account as opposed to the company account. I mean, when we had this back and forth over the ends on Discord, then you told me that. That's when I also started my personal uh, account, still not a YouTube channel. Um, it's tough when you start from zero for both, but uh, your advice makes sense here. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, going back to the business end, um, if we can, you already discussed distribution basically, and you know, with all these activities that you do, um, you, you said you expanded your team to go through the standard activities for a dev tools company, you know, software engineering, and then distribution, DevRel, marketing, and then you have customer success. And probably later, eventually you have some sort of enterprise sales motion or any outbound motion. Is that something that as a CEO, you today sort of like map out for the future? Are you going to let it come at its own pace and then, you know, scale up the team accordingly? How do you, how do you approach this aspect? Yeah, so... So one, being a CEO is 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 kind of 
a strange concept. Um, never done it before, so I'm still kind of <laughs> learning ropes, but I have a lot of founder friends, so that, that makes it a <laughs> lot easier, right? Um, but the, the key aspect here is is we're, we're taking a an approach that for some people may seem oh they're doing it too slow or they're 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 not being risk of like they're not making risks to to for growth right so the way that we've kind of handled this is is i'm not willing to scale the team if um we can't do it ourselves so for marketing and distribution all those things like i'm doing all of that right now so i do all of the 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 change logs i do blogs i do basically anything that's marketing based i do um and then moving forward with that like andreas takes care of the 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 tech side of things he takes care of the team for the most part and i do all the paperwork that comes along with being a business so you know i make sure the accounting and the bookkeeping all that stuff is done and done correctly and and our accounting team have whatever they need um and then as that goes on so enterprise and outreach and things like that uh we're we're doing that ourselves right now. So mm-hmm. right now we're still leveraging. Uh, I, I, friends isn't not the right word. Uh, we're we're leveraging contacts that we have in the industry, right? So we know a lot of people that are in our space based upon a couple of things. Whether it's like we know they have an API and maybe they're not doing it right, um, or maybe they're thinking about having an API, and and we've talked to them in the past, and maybe now's the time to start talking to them again. Um, and then on top of that, because of the word of mouth and, mm-hmm. and things like that, it makes it very easy for these business plus slash enterprise customers to actually come to us and reach out to us. Um, we probably won't hire a salesperson for a long time just because one enterprise is not our actual target audience today. Mm-hmm. We're more targeted on startups and, and business, medium business size customers who need these features today and don't already have like an ingrained system. Um, and sure, in the future, we'll probably start tackling those people and scaling the team at that point will be a decision that I probably make. And then Andres will, you know, we're 50 50 partners. So I'll talk to him about like, hey, I think we need this type of person. And we'll talk about it internally and we'll make a decision. And then once we've decided if we think it's a good idea, we'll actually pitch it to our own team. So most decisions that happen at Unkey is a complete, everybody at the, the company makes these decisions. Um, for example, we just started sponsoring open source software. So we did Drizzle just yesterday because um, we love the Drizzle team. Um, and, and then they do really good work. So I, I basically went to Andreas and said, hey, we should we should give some of our VC money away by sponsoring people that we're using. So we did drizzle. And then we said to the team like, Hey, we're going to allocate $500 a month. Uh, We've given this much to, to the drizzle team. So we have this left who else or what else in our stack would you like to sponsor? Um, And then, you know, we'll filter those out and then we'll make that decision. Um, And it's similarly with Mike, Mike was already hired before Dom was. So we gave Mike the opportunity to actually sit down and talk to Dom and be part of the entire hire process because we wanted him to feel that I'm part of this team and yet sure I have equity in the company, but I'm actually making the decisions that drive the company forward. And sure, there's some decisions that I just make and like the CEO makes those decisions, but for the most part, we 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 try and make it a collaborative effort because just like open source, like our company is very open and, and we're open about everything with our team, financials, where we're spending our money, where is it going? How are we spending it? Why are we spending it? All those things um, to make it as, as transparent as, as possible. Um, and I think that came from, from learnings from both of us. Uh, so like for me, I've been in a situation where the company didn't tell us about financials at all. And I did no idea how much money or runway, all those things that you, you worry about in a startup. And then I was let go because they were running out of money and, and, and they just didn't have the money to, to, to pay me. Um, and it was like a big surprise. And I was like, oh God, now I've lost my, like, how do I provide for my family? Or how do I provide, you know, how do I pay for my bills? All those things. And um, so we try and be as open and transparent as possible when we um, do that. And we, we, they have unfettered access to essentially what we send to the founders every every month. I mean, the investors, not the founders. Yeah. 
I love that. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing this. And, uh, you know, the previous points about marketing and inbound and outbound and sales, like it might be like, you know, kind of like go can go without saying for a lot of people, but for people getting started right now, they haven't worked in startups in the past or in developer tools, infrastructure. Uh, and I, th I think this can be very useful. So thanks. Thanks for elaborating on that. And uh, now building a sustainable business, um, having paying customers, pricing gives people a hard time very often. And I mean, I, <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't stress this more, like same, same with us uh, here at Algora. So is there something you could share about this or maybe a mistake to avoid from what you've seen so far? Yeah. 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 So, uh, so Anki, when we first did the pricing, it was just like, I don't know, this will do kind of thing. Like that was the attitude mm -hmm, we had. Mm -hmm. Like we just didn't know what to put out for pricing. We, we were trying to understand, like we did some napkin math about how much each verification cost us per million and like try and work backwards from that. Um, and, and, and at first we were like, yeah, this pricing makes sense. Um, and then what we saw was like a common theme of like people would approach us and be like, hey, like want to use your service, but your pricing is a bit skewed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what we need. Uh, is there any way we can like work out some sort of pricing for us? Um, and we, we did on that one time, like we did it for our biggest customer because they were like, we're going to do millions. And we were like, right. oh my God, someone wants to pay us. Like, let's do special pricing for them. Um, and so we just changed our pricing as of uh, this year. Uh, and essentially what we did was we 15x the amount of verification you get. Um, we like half the price. So basically uh, pricing is not permanent. That's the first thing I want to say is pricing is not a permanent feature. You look at it and you say, I think this is what my customers are willing to pay us. And I think this is fair. And odds are you've got it wrong. The odds are that whatever you pick the first time you put pricing out is wrong. Um, and what you need to do at that point is then take the feedback from customers. Every time someone makes a comment about your pricing, whether it's good or bad, right? Like, like, oh, it's so cheap. Thank you so much. Like, you've saved us so much dev time. Like, great. Okay, that's a past one for the positive pile. Um, but if someone, if, if you continuously get things like, uh, do you offer custom pricing because we need to do this amount of work, um, and it's going to cost us X and that's more than we're willing to pay. You, you, you take that feedback and you think about it. So I spent a lot of time and we actually made this kind of mistake at Clerk too, which was I looked at every, we at Clerk, we looked at people in the industry and we basically just copied and pasted what they did. Um, and similarly, I actually did this when we first did the pricing at Unkey. What we did was we looked at authentication providers. And mm -hmm. said, this is what they charge for like monthly active users or whatever. And we'll base it upon that. Um, the second iteration that we just did, I actually did it more on like, okay, if I'm a business and I pay this much amount, how many times can I run, my, run a verification against keys mm -hmm. um, before I have to pay Unki more money? So like $25 gets you in the door. Okay, if I get to here potentially could i be monetized at that point right so the original pricing it was 10,000 verifications and 250 keys which sounds like a large number until you actually think about how apis work and then you realize oh no that's not really a huge number it's actually quite a small number um so sooner or later you're going to have to pay me pretty quickly um so what we did was we i sat down i looked at api in general and looked at like gateway pricing and, and, and things like that and movers and shakers in the industry and said, okay, how can we make this as easy as possible to say $25 is a bargain? And then you're kind of locked in and, and you feel comfortable paying us more money. But also you feel like by the time you actually have to pay me more money, you've already made enough money to cover it. Um, and, and so I kind of went through a few iterations. I sent it to the team. Mm -hmm. The team came back and said like, nope, still think it's too expensive. Like. You need to move some stuff around. So we moved a bit more and then we landed on what pricing is today. Um, and yeah, and I imagine in six months, maybe we'll revisit again and I'll look at it and say, okay, maybe we need to change this or that. Um, and, and, or maybe a year from now. But right now what we have for pricing is it, it feels super fair. And I think the biggest thing for us was we changed the pricing and then the next day, uh, the, we changed it on Friday. And then on Sunday, we had a new customer sign up. And then on Monday, they paid us. 
So for us, that felt like, okay, yeah, that, that we definitely made the right decision here. There was no conversation. I never even interacted with this person. They just signed up, signed up their business and then immediately paid us. Um, and that felt kind of like a, yep. Okay. I think we're close to what the pricing should be. Um, and being self-serve, you don't really want to talk to anybody if you, if you can avoid it. Great. Thanks so much for sharing this. Uh, again, super challenging topic. Uh, mm -hmm. Being an open source maintainer and, uh, and, you know, having also Andreas, of course, share his own um, pains or, or glory days. Uh, is there something we can say about how you're running the process, advice to people who might be getting started now? Um, yeah, for sure. So uh, I think I'll do two pieces here. I'll do contributing to open source as one and then being a maintainer as a different piece. So if you want to contribute to open source, which I advise if you're even interested in just like seeing how maybe real products work in the world and it's not corporate based, um, find people that uh, are good at labeling things, uh, pick a project that you're passionate about. Uh, like I always, cow.com is like the gold standard of commercial open source. Uh, a lot of people know who they are. And if you don't, and then maybe you should look up who they are and then delete your Calendly account and sign up for a cow card. But anyway, exactly. <laughs> um, they, they are essentially what the gold standard is really for open source these days, um, especially in a, like a SaaS based product. Like there are other others out there. TRPC is a great example. Um, even Theo's create T3 app is a great example of like other projects that aren't commercial based. And use all of this by the way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Us too. Yeah. Uh, like we're all using very fairly similar stuff. But like the idea here is, is find a project that you're really passionate about and go and help them and join their Discord or join their Slack or whatever kind of community they have. That's step number one if you, if you really want to start into this space. And then step number two is, is don't be afraid to do non-code contributions. Like documentation is probably one of the most lacking pieces in a dev tool company. And even like a spelling mistake sucks in your docs, right? Like if you spell something right, it sucks, whatever. Doing a PR and, and fixing that issue uh, is amazing. Um, first, we appreciate it so much. Um, and I think people think that, uh, no, the only way to contribute is code. Like, no, please look at our docs and be like, this sucks or these words don't make sense or whatever it might be, right? Or this is out of date. Um, contributing to those really makes a big difference to open source companies. Um, and then secondly, if there is like a first time issue tag, look at those and, and kind of feel out and, and, and read the contribution guide so that you know how these companies work. Cause some are a little different than others. Uh, we have a very slightly different, uh, thing in ours, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but overall, like, yeah, read the contribution guide, start with something simple like docs or something just so you can understand the workflow from end to end right like okay i've made this change i've put a pr in i, I you know i followed all the steps okay that that's been you know merged okay now maybe i feel more comfortable taking a look at the code and setting that up and, and get, get and going um and even up to that point may i add that you know you, you set up the project you took it for a spin maybe you can open an issue and provide some feedback how that experience right. is better for a next contributor and similar exactly. documentation or even landing pages example apps there's there's really an endless um, list of, of ways you could contribute, code or no code. So, yeah, so for sure. And then as a and maintainer? Then, and then as a maintainer, right, uh, my advice is, is make sure you put some structure in place um, and make it make sense for everybody, right? So the people at Unki follow the same standards as people that would contribute from open source. Um, so we, we have uh, one rule, which is there must be an issue associated with whatever the PR is. Um, so if you're a contributor, essentially all it requires is that you open an issue and somebody approves it on the team for internal purposes. We pre everything is pre-approved. So for, if you're in a, one of our maintainers, it's pre-approved. Um, so you don't have to wait until someone says like, yep, that's fine. Go ahead, do whatever. Um, for bug fixes, we don't really enforce it, but for features and any enhancements we do. Um, and then secondly is making sure you have like great um issue templates and feature request templates and documentation templates um so it's easy for the user to get into that space and then similarly with your contribution guide 
making sure people understand how your contribution workflow works. So for us, we have like PRs have to be in a specific format. Um, you know, you have to do these following steps before we'll accept the PR. You have to sign a CLA. All those things are kind of like required. And we make sure that's clear when you open a PR. Mm -hmm. um, and then as a maintainer is keeping good, keeping on top of those PRs that come in. It's very hard. Like for us, it's, it's, yeah. it's super difficult. Like we're trying to ship fast and like produce product because we, we, you know, we want more people to pay us and all these kinds of things, but keeping on top of them. So we, we try and do it uh, like once a week minimum of like each person in the team can look at them and say, okay, yeah, this one's ready. I feel comfortable that like the code looks good. I've tested it. The tests don't fail, blah, 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 blah. Everything looks good. We can probably merge this. Um, and we'll take it for a quick test spin in Vercel and then we'll test the API. And then when we're happy, we'll just merge them in. Um, and then letting people know that like, Hey, this PR has been open for a while. Like you've opened a PR, we've asked for a change and you're not done anything. Like, can is this something we can help you with or are you just busy do you want us to close this pr like what was the status um on the other end um and then one big thing that i think some people don't like but i particularly like is can i be assigned this issue seems to be a controversial topic in open source so like i prefer if you ask me if like hey can i take this issue on before working on it uh cuz we found that even if we have people assigned to issues people will still try and contribute that issue and it's like well i have internal team members working on this issue right now they're looking yeah. at it right now um and, and so having that like just that like hey i'm looking at this issue i think i can take care of it in today like do you mind if i take this issue really helps us out because we get notified in our slack that someone's asked a question and we go and look um and two it kind of starts that relationship between you and an open source maintainer Excellent. Uh, thanks so much. This is uh, super helpful for people to hear. Really appreciate it. And uh, I think we can move to the demo of sure. Anki, if you would like. And Absolutely. Uh, my co-founder is up joining. So. Let me see here. Let me present my screen. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's thinking about it. <laughs> there we go. Let's talk about Anki. Uh, first, let me sign out. Let's start from the beginning. Okay. So if you don't know what Anki is, and you, you, maybe you do, maybe you don't, depending on who's listening to this, essentially the idea here is we provide API authentication um, for being able to scale a user-facing API. Uh, we provide ways to create keys, verify keys, manage your keys, um, and essentially you can do it in seconds. We're an API first company, so I won't be showing the API today just because I'm on a machine that doesn't have any development stuff on it. Uh, it's just my content creation machine, but we can show most of it off in the dashboard anyway. Um, so once you sign up for an account, you'll get dropped into this kind of screen right here. And this is where what we call a workspace. Now, workspace can either be a personal account or it can be for your businesses. As you can see, I have many different businesses. Uh, that I've tested over the, the uh, months. Um, and an API is essentially a way for you to group API keys together. So this could be production, this could be test, this could be staging, or it could be an API, right? right? It could be like, um, this one is AI fun. So that could be a route that you have for, for your company. Um, and then looking inside your APIs. So if we load this API up, uh, we give you out of the gate essentially ways to look at how the keys are performing, what you've done in the month that you're currently in, and how those uh, verifications work. So we have basically three real types of uh, verifications that could potentially happen. One is what you really want, a successful verification. This just means that we verify the key and the key is happy. Um, it's valid, it's enabled, all those kinds of things. Uh, then we have rate limited and usage exceeded. So you could actually see if someone's maybe potentially abusing your API. Um, and then the same for active keys. We show you how active your keys are over the last seven days, and you can push this all the way out to the last three months. Um, with this, essentially the idea here is we only actually charge you for successful verifications and anything else that happens. So if it's rate limited, it doesn't exist, it's disabled, 
uh the usage has succeeded it's expired all those things we actually we won't charge you for so that's how the usage base works um and then you can essentially play with your keys in here um all of the stuff that you see in the ui you can do in the api so as you can see here all these keys are enabled none of them really have any of these features but i'll show those features off um and then you can see when they were created by who owns it what the name potentially of the key is um etc so when you create a key in unkey essentially you have um four advanced usage and then just the standard stuff. So a prefix can be anything to make it easier to identify. So maybe you just do prod um, and we'll underscore it and then put the key on top. Uh, then you have an owner, which can be anything. Maybe it's from your authentication uh, provider. So maybe it's user XXXXX, you know, like some sort of user ID that you can easily identify this owner as. And then the name is just a name of the actual key itself. Um, and then you can add all of these custom things. So for example, limited usage, you can add that this key can only be used 100 times. And then you have the option to actually refill this automatically. So for example, I could go in here and say every day, add 10, and that will refill 10 to this key. And when you click create, we give you the key here, which I'll just show. Uh, this is the key prod underscore, and then whatever our key is. Uh, we only show you this once and there's no way to retrieve this key. So once you've uh, issued it, whether that's through your own UI or you're just manually giving this to a user, that's the last time you'll ever see the key. So they need to be stored um, somewhere safe or just pass it on to your user and your user can have it um, as is. And so this essentially is how we verify any key in our application. Uh, what we do uh, is you curl this endpoint with your key and we'll tell you whether or not it is valid or not. And I can technically show this using RecBin really quick. Don't do this in production. Uh, but essentially what we do here uh, is we'll send the key down. And when we run this, uh, maybe not. Maybe it won't work. Ah, there we go. Uh, you'll get this back here, which is... The key itself, is it valid? And you can check against that. And then the owner ID, any metadata associated with the key and how many remaining it has left. So right now it has 99. So if this user uses it another 99 times, the key will then become invalid and you'll get a response back that says usage exceeded. Um, the idea here is these are all globally distributed keys. So regardless to where the user is, you'll get the same minimal latency from start to finish. Uh, and then uh, we cache it really heavily. So even when you get the key for the first time, it should just be as fast. Now, if we go here and look at created at, and this one is our latest one here from Thursday, you can see it has 99 remaining. It has a daily refill amount and the user ID is here. And then you get the options to do a bunch of different things. So if we go to details here, we can see when it was last used, success rate, rate limited usage exceeded, when the verification was, where the user agent was, what the IP address was, what the region was, all those things uh, are provided. And then you can actually update these keys. So through the API, which I'll show in the docs in a second, you can update these keys um, and also through the UI. So if you decide that remaining is no longer required, you can just disable it, hit save. And now this is no longer on and this key can be used however many times you want and vice versa, you can enable it and then set that to whatever you may need. Um, the idea here is that we want you to be able to essentially handle any scenario at any point without having to reissue a key or make some changes in your database to make this work. Um, on top of that, uh, we have this new audit logging system, which is just new. It tells you uh, who's creating keys, when they were created, um, all those kinds of things so that you can uh, look at these and say, okay, uh, this API has been created, who created it, uh, and maybe you can go and ask them why. Uh, and that's obviously internal. Uh, you can ignore the success thing here. That's just for me. Um, and then that, that's essentially it. And then we have a bunch of stuff in here for things like if you want Teams uh, on a non-personal account, you can invite users. Root keys are essentially what drives all the resources. So when you create a root key for the first time, you can now actually create keys via our API. 
Um, and then you can use that to update keys, delete keys, revoke keys, all those essential pieces that you might need. Um, and then I can just quickly talk about the docs because the docs are probably going to be uh, pretty important here. Um, so if we go to our API reference here, you can see that we have um, the ways you can actually test this in the documentation if you so wish, but it shows you uh, in all different languages how to expect this um, using just the straight HTTP requests um, and what is required and what is not. And then we have libraries in some of your favorite um, languages, whether it's TypeScript. Uh, we have a TypeScript one, which is an official SDK that we built. Same with the Hono package here. So if you're a Hono fan, you can use this to do middleware verifications. And then our um, contributors, such as Python, Elixir, Go, Nuxt, Rest, Spring Boot, are all things that you can you know, use and not have to worry about having to turn HTTP requests into the language that you choose. Of course, we have an open API spec, so that makes it fairly easy. Um, if there's one that's not available, you can use that to, to drive this information. And then on top of that, if you're interested in contributing, we have uh, a guide here that shows you how to set up everything in our uh, application. It tells you what's required, and then the rest of the third-party services are just optional. We show you how to do versioning. We show you how to add some features if you want um, what we do every day. And that's essentially Unki uh, in a nutshell. Uh, and we have a bunch of different features that I probably should just go through real quick. Uh, so we offer you rate limiting. Uh, we offer it in two ways. First way is like local, so it's super fast and on the edge. And then we have this global consistency version. So if you're really conscious about having a strict rate limiting and you're not too concerned, um, if you're really concerned about how it, and it should never be exceeded, you can use this uh, global version which adds uh, latency to our verifications because we have to go and check our database every single time. But the fast um, on the local side, which is edge everywhere, it will be much, much faster. Temporary keys, which is essentially a way for you to just say, hey, it expires at this time. So if you need a monthly or a weekly key or some variant of that, we can offer that out as a way to basically expire the key. Remaining is what I showed you already, which is essentially just like, hey, 100 times, uh, and that will be how many times you can use it. Great for things like AI, if you need to purchase like 100 uses of some sort of AI API, uh, you can use that. Obviously, refill is part of this remaining feature. And then the analytics, we can do both in the UI now, and also we do have an endpoint. And then IP whitelisting, if you need a specific set of IPs, uh, that you can run against, we can have that in here, and that will be available. And then Q, uh, we can revoke the key in a couple of ways. You can disable it temporarily. You can delete the key. Um, but we want to make sure that you know that it could take up to 60 seconds to invalidate because we have to basically purge the cache from our um, durable objects. Um, and then we do have a Vercel integration. If you are using Vercel to deploy your uh, application, uh, you can do that too. Um, and that's it. That's Unkey uh, really, really quickly in a elevator pitch style. Wow. <laughs> very, very cool. Uh, I, I especially like how like all these industry standard features like refilling and then rate limiting, audit logging and analytics like come together in a single package. I love it. And I also really like the fact that um, your API keys are distributed globally. That should bring the latency really down, right? Like, do you yeah, guys yeah, our, made our any average, measurements that? Yeah, our average latency, like in most of the globe, is under thirty milliseconds. Uh, most places, it's even under ten milliseconds. So it's like really, really fast. Um, thanks to Cloudflare, uh, who who where our workers are. Um, but yeah, we can we our our biggest concern was making sure we never add latency to your application. Because when you build an API key system, maybe internally for the first time, it's not a concern. Like you don't care about global distribution until you get a customer that's in Germany. And now every time they use your API key, their application takes, you know, a full 30 seconds to run one request or whatever it might be. Because you've got to go from Germany to US East, US East does all the processing, comes back and then sends it down. 
Um, and, and we've managed to reduce that latency right down so that you never have to worry about that regardless to where your customer is. That's amazing. Super cool. That was awesome. And uh, thank you so much for the demo. And maybe we can close the interview with uh, showing the Anki repo on GitHub. Yeah, yeah, sure. We can do that. Let me just pull it up <laughs> and I will share my screen. Here we go. Uh, uh, share. Let me zoom in a little bit. Uh, yeah, so you can find our Unki repo at unkied slash Unki. Uh, this is the main repo where all the work is done. You can look through it. You can see how we're doing all these cool things. Uh, feel free to grab an issue, uh, look at some issues, create issues, et cetera, et cetera. If you're interested in examples, we actually have a new example repo here, which has a bunch of different examples in it from uh, AI billing, how to make a CLI, how to use Unki with Clerk or Superbase functions. We have a bunch of stuff in there to make it as easy as possible for you to essentially get started with Unki and use it uh, for yourself. Very, very cool. Awesome. Thank you so thanks, much. Thanks a lot for sharing all the gold nuggets with us. Yeah, absolutely. Would... Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, James. All right. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>